Good morning. In this talk, I want to talk about the entropy of a black hole. And why is that interesting? No reason, it's just interesting in itself. However, aside from that statement, it is interesting because it's the way I think quantum gravity will be approached. <clears throat> I don't think quantum gravity will be done in terms of gravitons, I think not. I think it will be done in terms of bits of information and that's where this thing comes in. So that's another aspect of it, but in itself it's interesting enough, the entropy of a black hole. 1973, Hawking um, <clears throat> and Bekenstein. Okay, so first of all, <clears throat> okay, well let's talk about quantum gravity for a little bit. There will be no theory of quantum gravity in terms of general gravity. You can't it's like, it'd be like quantizing a sound wave in air. You can quantize sound waves in metals, solids, phonons, but not in the gas, like in this room here. Cannot be done. So for general gravity in the vicinity of a galaxy, no quantum gravity. In the vicinity of a solar system, no, or the sun, same thing. But in the vicinity of the extremes of a black hole, yes. Let's have a look at it first, and then we'll derive it. The entropy of a black hole, S, is given by 1 fourth K, the area of the black hole, over A0, what I call A0. A0 is actually the Planck area. About 10 to the power of minus 7, 0 square meters Planck length. I will derive the Planck length today too. So this is the actual formula. That's a 4. Now that 4 doesn't have to be there. And that 4 will disappear at the end of my talk with the point of view of Tuft and Suskind. Okay? It's called the holographic point of view. So we're going to get to that. Let's talk about entropy first. Actually, let's not do that. Let's look at some of the main people involved in this. Everything begins with, actually, Galileo, gravity. But we'll start, we have to have a cutoff point somewhere. We'll start with Newton, 1642 to 1727, because we need the, the escape velocity from him. John Mitchell, the escape velocity being the speed of light, He's actually Irish, Anglo-Irish, 1724 to 1793. Henry Cavendish, without him using the torsion balance invented by John Mitchell and also used by Charles Augustus Coulomb to measure the electric constant, Cavendish measured G, the big G in Newton's law of gravity, uh, was not done in, uh, as far as I know, Newton's lifetime. So Newton couldn't actually get the results he wanted numerically without this G. Clausius, entropy in terms of large-scale thermodynamics. Carnot, the fission engine, I'll talk about that too. Boltzmann, entropy in terms of, um, how can I put it, microstates, cannot Boltzmann's law cannot properly be derived. People try to derive it, but it's not done. It is intuitively written down. Even Einstein said that. He, Einstein didn't believe in this, by the way. Joshua Willard Gibbs from New Haven, Connecticut. A different form of the entropy formula of Boltzmann. Boltzmann's formula assumes that all states are equally likely. Gibbs' entropy assumes that there are different probabilities associated with each state. Shannon, Shannon entropy, 1949, Claude Shannon. The first arrival of information, the information formula that he derived is just like an entropy formula. Bekenstein, gosh, he passed away in 2015, I didn't realize that. Um, okay, Bekenstein derived this law along with Hawking. Hawking introduced the factor of 1 over 4, which I'm going to try and get rid of. Bill Unruh and Stephen Fulling, a formula for the 
temperature near an accelerating surface. I'll, I'll get to that in a minute, but you need this, sorry, this to derive this. Tuft and Suskind, the holographic point of view, the idea that the black hole may not, all the information on the spherical black hole can be encoded on a flat surface, let's say a disk. So that's those guys. <coughs> So we begin by looking at entropy. Entropy in general. Well, entropy first arises from the Clausius uh, point of view. Clausius. I think it's Rudolf, I can't remember. So if we have an engine, it must operate between two heat reservoirs, a hot one and a cold one, okay? So heat is transferred from the hot to the cold reservoir. Let's say there's 10 joules up here. And there's gonna be eight down here. Along the way, two joules got converted into work. Now that's 100% efficient. The two joules got converted into work. So that the efficiency is one minus, sorry, I'll say it like this. The difference between the hot and the cold reservoir temperatures or heat reservoirs over the cube hot is going to be the efficiency. That into that gives me 1 minus EQ cold over DQ hot. <clears throat> now, if we look at this very special cycle, <coughs> a reversible cycle, let's get rid of this. We're going to consider an engine that's reversible. That means you can compress it and decompress it, compress it and decompress it, compress it and decompress it, and get energy out of it on each <coughs> maneuver. <coughs> so we look at a PV diagram. Pressure times volume is work. <clears throat> so work gets done if we can get an area. Force times distance, pressure times volume. What we need is <clears throat> to create an area. Now to get an area for a reversible case, we need a special case. An engine must operate between a hot and a cold reservoir. So we'll take two isotherms. An isotherm is where no heat, uh, sorry, there's no change of temperature during the process. Okay, dt equals zero. Now we want to make a figure that we can get an area from. We want to be able to create an, in an integral, so we need to fill in the walls. We fill in the walls here and here. With two adiabatic processes, they are reversible. Isothermal and adiabatic. What does that mean? No heat enters or leaves the system. Adiabatic. So now we've created a figure. We've created a figure because the adiabats have a different slope compared to the isotherms. And we can find the area in here. And that's the work done. The work done in there 
will be the most efficient kind of process that we can get, and such an engine is called a carano. After Sadie Carnot, that's his middle name. I don't know, his first name was something much simpler. But the Carnot engine is the most efficient engine we can get. Now for the Carnot engine, this whole thing simplifies. DQ cold over DQ hot are equivalent. So therefore we can equate them and find that there is a conserved quantity. <clears throat> and physicists love conserved quantities, right? This conserved quantity, we're going to call the entropy. So that in this cycle here, entropy is equal to zero. Otherwise, in a non-reversible process, the entropy increases, okay? So in most natural processes, the entropy increases. In this very special reversible process, the entropy equals zero. And the entropy has a formula, dq, dq over t. So that's our entropy. Let's go to the next step. Now, Ludwig Boltzmann <coughs> um, determined entropy in terms of uh, microstates. Now, let me sure I got that right. Now look, Big Boltzmann wrote down k equals log to the base e z, whatever z is, I'll tell you in a minute. And k is Boltzmann's constant 1.38 by 10 to the power of minus 23 joules per Kelvin, which is r over n a. n a is Avogadro's number, okay? Let's look at this. Now what's a macrostate? A macrostate is the description of a gas in terms of P, V, T, and S, or S. S is optional, okay? Basically it is P, V, and T, but there exists another um, thermodynamic variable, S, we're, we're just going to talk about for a macrostate, P, V, T, there are a certain number of microstates. And S is K times the number of those microstates. Let's do an example. Let's throw two dice. We want to get an 8. So an 8 can come by a 2 plus 6, a 3 plus 5, a 4 plus 4, a 5 plus 3, a 6 plus 2. One, two, three, four. No, two to six, three and five, four and four, five and three, six and two. Yeah.
So there are four microstates in this particular situation. And S will be K times log to the base D of 4. Now, in bits, binary units, these are thermodynamic units. For the case of using units which are binary units, S is much simpler. S is 2, right? The entropy is 2 units in bits, 2 bits. Actually, that's, a saying, that's like saying the information we get uh, is two bits if we, were, if we examine that microstate. So that's Boltzmann. Now in Boltzmann's case, all states were equally probable. Now we look at uh, Gibbs. Joshua Willard Gibbs from New Haven, Connecticut. Let me check on the camera. Yeah, it's working okay. That's the formula that I'm not going to discuss. It just changes the structure of the formula slightly. Pi log Pi is the Gibbs formula for entropy. Now we get to Shannon. Claude Shannon. Uh, what years were his year? 1960 and 2001, that was his year. But he did this, Shannon, Shannon entropy is the beginning of information theory. But we write it in units of bits. It looks the same as Gibbs, okay? Shannon entropy information. So we're going to start using the words entropy and information interchangeably. So we're doing a simple example. We're going to toss two coins. We toss a coin, no, we toss a coin twice. Uh, So we can consider the two events of this. The first time we toss the coin, the probability of getting heads will be, let's say, a half. And of course, log a half. The second time we toss the coin, the probability of getting heads is still a half. Now, if we take the half and invert it, we get a negative sign. Log a half becomes minus log two. And this is all to the base two. Log of 2 to the base 2, the log of a number is the power to which the base must be raised in order to get the given number. So it's going to be minus, minus 1. Negative times negative is 1, sorry. A half, sorry. And a half plus a half is one. One bit of information you receive when you toss a coin twice because it 
stands to reason. Okay, if you toss a coin the first time, you're going to get a heads or a tails. Toss it the second time, you're going to get a heads or a tails. Equally likely to get a heads or a tails, the two you, basic things together gives you the full information of one bit. Okay, we're going to stop there to uh, start talking about another aspect of this.